History is a clock that people use to tell their political and cultural time of day. It is also a compass that people use to find themselves on the map of human geography. History tells of people where they have been and what they have been, where they are and what they are. Most important, history tells a people where they still must go and what they still must be. The relationship of history to the people is the same as the relationship of a mother to her child. How do you describe a legend, an African-American hero, an historian, an activist who for half a century has charted a singular course dedicated to the intellectual and spiritual liberation of a people? Though his eyes are now darkened by glaucoma, he continues to enlighten the lives of thousands of men and women through the pages of his many books and in university classrooms across the country. How do you describe a legend? You can't, really. But you can meet the men and women who influenced him. You can learn from him the hidden history of the African people. Learn from him a different way of making sense of this complex and often very confusing world. And you can let Dr. John Henry Clark tell his own extraordinary story in his own soulful style. Cropper Farm in Union Springs, Alabama, New Year's Day, 1915. That was a great feast day in our family. And because my mother was a favorite in the family and I was late arriving, she said that nothing would be killed in this family until my child is born. And I didn't arrive until three and Everybody was hungry. The feast had not started, and I wasn't exactly welcome. <laughs> they never quite forgave me for that, holding up the feast. My early schooling was in a uh, one-room schoolhouse that we called Miller's Hill School. When we moved slightly out of the city, I was chosen to go to city school officially. I never finished high school in the formal sense until later years. In fact, I taught two generations before I took time out to get my BA, my master's, and my PhD. Now, I have it all now, but uh, I'm principally self-trained. My university was the public library and well-chosen second-hand bookstores. 
<laughs> so while I grew up poor, I grew up in a very rich environment, culturally rich. I grew up with a whole lot of love and affection, a lot of lap time, a lot of slap time, too, because I wasn't permitted to get away with too much. Miss Evelina Taylor is my fifth grade teacher, and she might be the foundation teacher in my life. In addition to teaching me basic good thinking and good conduct, she called me into her room during her lunch hour one day and told me to stop playing the fool because I was playing the fool just to get accepted. And she said, it is better to be right and march into hell than to follow a bunch of fools into heaven. I wanted to do something to impress Miss Taylor. And we had current events on Friday. We wanted to say something unusual because I worked for white people before and after school and they had magazines. They would receive them one day, read them hurriedly, or throw them away the next day. So when I got up for current events, I always had something decidedly different to say about my own people and about other people. No, I wanted to do something real, real big. So I went to a lawyer that uh, I worked for before and after school. I can still remember his name, Gag Steider, and I asked him for a book about my people in early world history. He says, I'm sorry, John, that uh, you came from a people who have no history. My mind would not accept that. I continued to search, and I opened a book called The New Negro, and I opened to an essay called The Negro Digs Up His Past. And for the first time, I knew that I came from a very old people, that we were older than slavery, older than oppression, older than Europe. Now the scramble began for more information. During the disaster years of the Great Depression, Americans in huge numbers take to the rails. They don't take Pullman cars or day coaches. They stow away on the freights, riding the rails in search of the opportunity to create a better life. John Henry Clark wrote them. Out of the South first, briefly to Chicago, and then on to New York City. I had a dream. I thought that because I'd had some success in writing local plays, writing lyrics for songs for local plays, and that I could go write professionally. It was a dream. It's a fantasy. I was pursuing this fantasy. At 18, you can pursue all kinds of fantasies. In the shadow of Manhattan's towering skyscrapers lies black, sprawling Harlem, greatest Negro metropolis in the world. My impressions of the Harlem community, in the first place, it was a clean community. It was an orderly community. It was a safe community. It was a community with its customs that we have forgotten now. Street speaking customs. Strolling customs. Social customs. There was a time when 7th Avenue now Adam Powell Boulevard was the street of choice. And you did not walk down 7th Avenue on Saturday or Sunday without a coat and a tie. There was a custom of getting your lady in your long good suit and walking down 7th Avenue to show her off. You would walk 15 blocks. Sometime when you had a dollar or so to spend, you would take on the Fifth Avenue 
open bus all the way down to New York University and all the way back. And she was satisfied, and the whole evening you hadn't spent a dollar. A lot of times you didn't have one. They sure don't make ladies like that anymore. There was a time there were three functioning vaudeville theaters in Harlem, all well patronized. The Lafayette, Harlem Opera House, and the Apollo. The old Lincoln Theater, now a church, used to be a legitimate theater while the plays downtown would be brought uptown with the play with the black cast. Tyron, show my face. And that was our Broadway. I got involved with the communists and the socialists and for the radicals and begin to read literature on the Russia of that day and to see movies about Russia. And I was never a member of the Communist or the Socialist Party. I was active briefly in the Young Communist League. We were looking for a way out of the condition in which we live. And they opened doors for us and gave us a platform we otherwise did not have. Paul Robeson was the one artist who made the great sacrifice based on commitment. And that commitment is that an artist supposed to use his or her art to change the society in which they live. W.E.B. Du Bois is our greatest single intellect we produced in the whole of the Western world, and he's not just a black American intellect. He is an American intellect equal to any. W.E.B. Du Bois, Paul Robeson, the party came closest to what those men wanted to stand for in the world was a fair deal for the working people of the world. We would examine it later to our sorrow. That we were in an argument between not a liberator and an oppressor, but two oppressors with different techniques and methodology of oppression. In the final analysis, Russia did not want us to be free any more than in the United States and England and the imperial powers, but they wanted us under their domination. I never thought the left movement, communists or socialists, made in a serious study of the history and the background of the African people of the world. And they had a preconceived notion of us that had nothing to do with our reality. And these African communal societies, who each got according to his needs, were not copied from Europe because they existed before there was a Europe. In these societies, based on the concept of the family and the community, Everyone in the society had a responsibility. And in these societies, there was no word for jail because no one had ever gone to one. No word for orphanage because no one had ever thrown away any children. No word for old people's home because no one had ever thrown away grandma and grandpa. And while I had some admiration for the conclusion of Karl Marx, I dare to say he was a political opportunist in the Johnny Come Lately because he was rehashing something that was in the world before the first European war a shoe lived in the house that had a window. During my early years in Harlem and the 30s, my writing consisted mainly of poetry, short stories and little essays on aspects of history. The Harlem Renaissance writers, of course, 
influenced me. Uh, I knew uh, Claude McKay. I knew Langston Hughes. I knew Richard Wright before he had published Native Son. I knew Wallace Thurman, O'Neill Larson, Jesse Fawcett. I found the Pan-Africanist consciousness in a Langston Hughes and to some degree in a Claude McKay. But the rest of them were rather parochial. Finally, I got to meet Arthur Schomburg. Arthur Schomburg, mentor to two generations of African-American scholars. The legacy of this Puerto Rican-born historian is the world's definitive institution of its kind. Harlem's Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. I went down to the 135th Street Library, and he was on the third floor. And I asked, very humbly, asked the librarian, do you know anybody who will give me a letter to see Arthur Schomburg? And she said very sharply, you know, impatiently, because she was short of help, you just have to walk up three flights. I walked up three flights, and there Arthur Schomburg was holding down the desk, being 18 and rash, I wanted to know the history of African people of the world. Henceforth, right now, within the hour, his lunch hour, all of it. He said, sit down, son. What you are calling African history and Negro history are the missing pages of world history. Then he said, son, Go study the history of your masters. Go study the history of the people who enslaved you and find out why they found it a necessity to remove an entire people from the respectful commentary of the history of the world. Well, my earliest impressions of them was a people in power who intended to stay in power, and I began to wonder why they had so much and other people had so little and why everybody I knew worked harder than they. Who made this arrangement? I studied European history and world history. Now, when I went back to Schomburg with some knowledge of background of European history, now he began to show me how to study African history. Arthur Schomburg taught me the interrelationship of African history to world history. Willis and Huggins of the old Harlem History Club taught me the political meaning of history. And from the lectures of William Leo Hansberry of Howard University, I learned the philosophical meaning of history. The most valuable lesson I've learned is that when you address a people by their right name, that name must relate to land, history, and culture. All people go back to the geography of their original origin and identify themselves, no matter where they live on the face of the earth. We have overused the word black because black tells you how you look, but it don't tell you who you are. You can call an Italian white, but that don't tell you anything about him. We are the only people who seem to have lost that all essential trait of geographical and historical reference. Around 1933 up until 1934, 1935, Harlem's was main activity was how to make Harlem a congressional district so that Harlem could elect its own congressman. Adam Powell was just began to show his weight. We were fighting to get jobs on 125th Street, fighting to get jobs in our own neighborhood. 
I admire Adam with all of his faults. He was the best person that black America has ever sent to Washington. He got the job done. When he went to Washington the first time, they told Mr. Powell that we don't accept blacks in the congressional dining room. And Adam smiled and said, well, you don't accept them. Well, that's your custom. The next day, Adam got the tallest and the meanest looking and the blackest of the blacks he could find and marched them into the congressional dining room as his guest and got away with it. But it was a period when we were reassessing our role in the whole of the Western world. We were tuning into Africa as much as we could and having African forums and making a serious study of African history. Black men wanted to go to Ethiopia and fight on the side of the Ethiopians, but America would not give them passport and let a single one leave the country for that purpose. And yet, Italians could get passports to go and fight with Italian forces against Ethiopia. Now later, some of the same black men who couldn't get permission got permission to go fight in the Abraham Lincoln Brigade in Spain. I'm a physician. Physician. And then why would you want to go over in Ethiopia? Well, I feel it's my duty to give my profession and, if necessary, my life in the cause of Ethiopia. And I desire and be happy to die for the defense of entire Africa, including Abyssinia. That's fine. Sign right here on the dotted line. See, originally, Africans did not define themselves by continent, but more by regions. Africa as a continent began to be defined by foreigners. In North Africa, the Romans had a province called Afrique. The word became Africa. The history, both known and hidden, of the land where time began has been a primary focus of Dr. Clark's scholarship throughout his long career. The concept of social order, the concept of an organized society came out of Nile Valley civilization before there was any other society that has been known to man functioning any other place in the world. The significance of Nile Valley civilization is that it was that civilization that set a standard of performance untouched by the other civilizations of the world. And people are reluctant to give an African credit for a creation that happened in Africa. They also forget that the Nile Valley stretches 4,000 miles into the physical body of Africa, and that it was the world's first cultural highway. For centuries, Eurocentric scholars had rejected the idea that the mighty Egyptian empire was in fact created and maintained by black Africans. The concept that Western civilization was the product of non-white intelligence, imagination, technology, and spirituality was unacceptable, both psychologically and politically. A brilliant Senegalese scholar and scientist would shake and many say topple the very foundation of that conventional wisdom. His name was Sheikh Anta Diop. His research was brought to the attention of the English-speaking world through the efforts of his longtime colleague and friend. I was wondering why his books had never been published uh, in the United States, he said, there was no publisher's interest in his books. And so it took me seven years to interest the publisher in the books of Sheikh Anta Diop. Diop's disciples refer to him as the Pharaoh of the Upper Nile. You must be strong enough and serene enough de voir les faits historiques to see the historical facts et de les interpréter and to in interpret them. Uh, nous pouvons tous être passionnés. We can all be impassioned. 
Mais ce n'est pas de cette manière que nous résoudrons les problèmes complexes de l'humanité. Donc cette domination dont nous souffrons, dont j'ai souffert moi-même, notre propre domination des autres races l'a précédé. Our domination of other races preceded it. Donc, l'Afrique a exercé un impérialisme continu pendant 4000 ans. For 4000 years, Black Africa had an imperialism. Toute l'Afrique occidentale était conquise et était justement sous la domination noire. All of Western Asia was under the, domi under the domination of blacks. On n'aurait pu jamais penser à cette époque-là que la situation pourrait un jour être renversée. No C'est pour ça que l'étude de l'histoire nous redonne la sérénité pour this apprécier is, les faits et les relativiser. This is why the study of history gives us the serenity required to appreciate the facts as they are. 97-4, he would challenge the major scholars of the world on the concept of Egypt not being anything other than an African state. In the conference on the peopling of Egypt, leading scholars of the world met and debated. Most of them wanted to put Egypt's origin outside of Africa. Sheikh Anton Diop and his protege, Diopo Obenga, placed Egypt within the context of Africa's totality. Sheikh Anton Diop was more than a historian, he was a scientist, he was a paleontologist, and he had proven that if he could get the pigment from some of the mummies, he could prove the African origins. All the rest of the conferees came just to disagree, and when it was all over, they had to admit these two men came prepared to prove their case. At that point, they began to close the door to the research of Sheikh and Adio. From the first dynasty to the invasion of Nile Valley, that was the first golden age. And from the third dynasty came the great multi-genius Imhotel, the real father of medicine, who lived 1,800 years before the Greek who was called the father of medicine. And when we read the biography of the Greek, he says, I am a child of M. Hotel. And from the 18th dynasty came the world's great social reformer and maybe one of the world's first deities, Akhenaten. He thought so much of life, he would not crush a flower. He outlawed warfare. Spirituality was a part of the total life of the people. Before the coming of the Europeans, the African was very religious. The step pure me was originally built for the temple at the top where you can go up and pray. This relates not just to the glorification of a pharaoh, but the spiritual outpouring of a people. This is what made the civilization of the Nile so great. At the same time that Egypt was in its 24th dynasty, Europe was just emerging from its preliterate past. The first show of European intelligence was a book called The Artists in the Iliad. That's about 850 B.C. Where is Egypt, 850 B.C.? Egypt is old and tired and has gone through 24 dynasties. It is on the eve of its last great dynasty that will come from the pharaohs in the south. And the Europeans have just read the book of folklore. Just south of Egypt lies another highly evolved black society, the Nubians. Their civilization thrived for some 3,000 years. I call the 25th dynasty the one dynasty from the south that moved up north and to tell their cousins, the Egyptians, how to rule 
a nation one more time in the great show of history. This was Africa's last walk in the sun. It was a great and mighty walk. That walk had lasted 10,000 years. Now it's coming to an end. Europe is just being born. The very word Europe is not even being used. drafted to the army in September 1941. I can say with certainty I was probably one of the best clerks, one of the worst soldiers the army ever had. I couldn't shoot, didn't like the hot sun, didn't like to go on those all-night trips, but I was a wizard of administration. I made sure my men got what was due to them as soldiers and men not as black men, but as soldiers and men. Well, after I returned from the army, it was not so much as finding myself again as a Pan-Africanist, but redefining myself as a Pan-Africanist. Remember, we had participated in a war that we were cynical about in the first place, and having participated in this war on a Jim Crow bases, getting out of the war, and there wasn't the employment that we had hoped would be there, I began to think more and more about the fact that African people would have to depend on themselves. Pan-Africanism would be perceived as a way to end African dependence on colonial masters a way to create free and independent nations, a way to transfer the continent's immense riches from the hands of invaders into those of the indigenous people of the land. I began to define Pan-Africanism as the building of an African world community, the union of African people in different parts of the world, the African population in India and the Pacific Islands, the African population in the Caribbean and Brazil and South America. And I was looking to the fact that we number a billion people on the face of the earth. If you put them all together and they did one thing in unison, even if it was wrong, it might alter the world. Africa has always been and still is the world's richest continent. Africa has always had things other people wanted, thought they couldn't do without, and didn't want to pay for. So therefore, there's always been an excuse to invade Africa. Alexander's invasion was the first purely European invasion of Africa. Everything that had happened in Egypt and in Africa before 332 BC was something that no European had anything to do with. Now we see the beginning of European occupation, and we see it as aggression, not bringing civilization, but destroying civilizations that it did not understand. The uninvited arrival of European armies in the Upper Nile Valley signals the beginning of the end for the highest civilization the world had known. The conquerors, quite literally, changed the complexion of the conquered. Now, 
you're beginning to get a mulatto-sized population that a whole lot of people keep misinterpreting as white. With each one of these invaders came the bastardization of the population based on the fact that for the sake of pleasure, the foreign soldier heads for the female population at a time the male population has been defeated in war. The Greeks rule didn't last that long before they were challenged. An ambitious and well-dressed bunch of thugs across the ocean, not very educated, but they could fight like hell, called Romans, <laughs> began to have ambition for the trade in the Mediterranean. Carthage, a powerful black state in North Africa, had imperial ambitions of its own. By the third century BC, its forces had crossed the Mediterranean and established a large province in Spain. The military commander of Carthage had apprehensions about his Roman neighbors and warned his son to keep a watchful eye. Hannibal's father, he would point across the ocean and said, there's some evil people over there. We better bring the war to them before they bring it to us. Hannibal never forget. Hannibal is only 26 when he takes charge of the army. He launches an audacious military adventure, leading his men and their elephants over the Pyrenees Mountains into France, then pointing them across the Alps, boldly, toward Rome itself. Heavy casualties, overextended supply lines, and defection of allies drive Hannibal off the soil of southern Europe. He retreats back home to Carthage. The Romans have made a mission, almost a cult, out of the destruction of Carthage. They would meet each other in the morning. Good morning, Roman citizen. Carthage must be destroyed. Yes, of course, Roman citizen, Carthage must be destroyed. Rome's legions clash with Hannibal near Zama. His troops are defeated. Hannibal is sent into exile. His once mighty nation becomes another colony of Rome and an administrative center for their empire. Now, the Roman Empire internally was not very rich. Africa became the breadbasket for the Roman Empire. And except for Africa, the Roman Empire would not have been able to sustain itself. Now, the Roman presence in North Africa is going to force into being one of the great events in human history. Roman taxation, Roman oppression would cause people to turn to new gods and question old gods, to turn to a story about a god who comes forth to rescue them. Now they would draw from African folklore the story of the child in the manger. Now, what am I saying? Later, in retrospect, he was referred to as Jesus Christ. Now, you can argue about the coloration of Christ if you want to, but I can sell that very quick, and we can go on to the next subject. Was he a Roman? The answer is no. Was he a Greek? The answer is still no. These were the only European types in that part of the world at the time. If he was neither Roman or Greek, he was one of those other people, and all of those other people were well, non-European and non-white. <laughs> and he came from the other people. During that time of Roman dominance, Africans hold high military and administrative posts in the empire. The Romans and the Greeks had no color prejudice comparable to the kind of prejudice we would know later on. Otherwise, why would three Africans become emperors of Rome? Why would there be 
three African popes. Finally, Constantine decided to make Christianity the religion of the whole of the Roman Empire. Now we're coming to the critical period when the Roman domination of the church so corrupted the church. The Africans began some disenchantment with the Roman interpretation of Christianity. Constantine calls a council of bishops and priests at a place called Nice. It's the Nicaean Conference. It is at this conference that the European created a European concept of Christianity. It was at this conference that they began to take the African saints out of the literature of Christianity. Now the corruption had started. The physical concept of Jesus Christ did not exist. Now how did it come into existence? Because the Pope commissioned it to come into existence. Michelangelo painted the picture using one of his relatives as model. In that picture, one of the finest pieces of propaganda ever projected in history has changed the minds of millions of people as who's supposed to represent God, whoever he or she is, and I have no problem with the she. Spirituality is a way of accepting the fact that there is a spiritual force in the universe larger than all of mankind. But someone had to come along and invent a word called God. And someone had to say of another God and say, mine is better than yours. And someone had to create faith. Someone said, I have the true faith. Religion is the organization of spirituality into something that became the handmaiden of conquerors. Nearly all religions were brought to people and imposed on people by conquerors and used as the framework to control their minds. My main point here is that if you are the child of God and God is a part of you, then in your imagination, God's supposed to look like you. And when you accept a picture of the deity assigned to you by another people, you become the spiritual prisoners of that other people. Many Africans became Roman citizens, just like many uh, black Americans today. I have nothing to do with Africa. I'm an American. I'm a citizen. I'm an American. I... There were Africans way back there with that same kind of split personality silliness, not knowing where their ethnic identity belonged. Rome's hold over its far-flung provinces weakens. In North Africa, it faces a new and fierce challenge, Islam. The Arabs, noticing the weakness of the Romans in North Africa, began to quote the favor of the Africans. Arabs convinced the local black populations to join in the struggle against a common oppressor. They also convinced many of them to abandon their traditional beliefs and pledge their allegiance to Allah. The Africans assumed that by supporting the Arabs, the Arabs would get the Romans literally off their back. They were right. The Arabs did get the Romans off their back. But the Arabs replaced 
the Romans on their back. And like most conquerors, they declared war on African culture and African ways of life. The Arab has always been a propagator and a defender of slavery. They've always rationalized slavery based on Islam. I do not think any religion sanction slavery. And any time you use a religion to sanction slavery, you're misusing that religion and misusing the word of God. Well, the Christians did it, and the Arabs have done it, and the Hebrews have done it. It's not right in any case. Islamic armies, their ranks dominated by African converts, defeat the Romans and push on to the continent of Europe. In the process, they capture Spain. There, the Africans and Arabs create a rich, cultured, and powerful empire. So powerful, it endures for 500 years. The achievement of the Arabs at this time is they have driven the Europeans out of the Mediterranean. The Europeans now must go back into Europe. They have no empire. No great connections outside of Europe. And because of this, they ultimately would go into a period called the Dark Ages. People are confused because when the European mentioned the Dark Ages, the Dark Ages for him were not the Dark Ages for other people. Concurrent with his dark ages, the African had his third golden age. As Europe suffers, three great kingdoms are emerging in West Africa, Mele, or Mali, Ghana, and Songhai. These were lands of enormous wealth, generated by their control of the trade routes across the Sahara, and the abundance of their gold mines. The kingdoms were known for their benevolent governments and their great respect for learning. For a while in history, there were only two great universities. The University of St. Cori at Timbuktu and the University of Salamanca in Spain. And the African was solely in charge of the one at St. Cori and partly in charge of the one at Salamanca. The Arabs had to some degree institutionalized the practice of African slavery. The Europeans internationalized it. In Europe, the wealth amassed from the slave trade makes the Industrial Revolution possible while laying the foundations of modern capitalism. In the Americas, the traffic in human souls creates a vast African diaspora, millions upon millions of people ripped from their homeland transported in chains to a distant, hostile world. The European came into Africa as a guest and was treated as a guest. The Africans are unsuspected, political, naive, as some of them still are, because he had nothing against the Europeans and he had never enslaved any Europeans. He just assumed automatically... No European would enslave him. He had never dealt with anyone who would uh, enslave the host and the wife who cooked the meal and lie about it. Around 1442, the first slaves would be taken out of West Africa. Spain and Portugal goes to the Pope, the leading arbitrator of that day, the one person in Europe with the greatest authority. The Pope would say to Spain and Portugal, you take the East and you take the West and you two good Catholic nations start fighting among yourselves. And then the profound statement before departure, you are both 
authorized to reduce to servitude all infidel people. The slave trade now had been sanctioned, and Europeans had been told they need not feel guilty of it because you're doing this to an infidel who is outside of God's grace. England went into the slave trade with a vengeance led by Captain Hawkins and the good ship Jesus. The ship was called the good ship Jesus. The coat of arms on the ship with two Africans bound back to back with their arms tied. So they saw no contradiction in being in the slave trade and being Christians at the same time. We cannot deal with this enough because we're still suffering from this inside of the mind of a lot of people in this world into the millions we are outside of humanity, outside of the grace of God. That's a terrible feeling as you walk the earth. Because what has been taken away is your essential humanity, your human beingness. And when they take away your human beingness, they take away your nationness. Early in the 19th century, the concept of slavery began to yield to the concept of colonialism, a more sophisticated form of slavery. Slavery as a system became unwieldy, and besides the point where it was saturated, everybody who wanted a slave had one who could afford one. The European nations of size that did not have any portion of Africa, began to grumble at the Berlin Conference, 1884 and 1885. The European powers of substance, who did not have any part of Africa, now were given some parts. Africans did not fall at the feet of the European invaders. They fought fiercely, bravely and continually. Anti-colonial wars started up down the coast of West Africa, in parts of inner Africa, and in the Congo. There was armed resistance. The Zulu wars lasted from the 1650s when the Boers arrived to the last Zulu war was 1906. In Ghana, the Ashanti wars lasted from early in the 18th century to the last Ashanti war led by a woman, Ye Asantiwa, in 1900. For a while, it looked as though the Europeans would not be able to hold on to the continent. More manpower and more ruthless treatment brought it mainly under their control. By 1884, 1885, and afterward, there's no, there was no dispute about who was in charge of Africa, just who was in charge of what part of it. We have been hung up with a myth, the myth of the conqueror and the invader as the bringer of civilization. No people ever brought civilization to another people at no time and at no place in history. It's one of the most protracted lies we ever listened to. Civilization is the art of being civil. The word civil means being peaceful and there's nothing peaceful about aggression only the slave can abolish slavery if someone is on your back you have to bend a little to balance them on your back now the best move if you want to get them off of your back is to stand straight up. There's something about an island of body water. 
increase a special kind of dream of because they did not know where they came from in Africa. They dreamed of the whole of it, bring it all together in one piece. The seeds of Pan-Africanism planted in the United States during slavery years later flourish in the fertile soil of the British West Indies. Trinidad produced the three greatest Pan-Africanists, H. Sylvester Williams, C.L.R. James, and George Padmore. In Trinidad, they found, found the Pan-African League. H. Sylvester Williams would eventually call it Pan-African. He would call a conference in London in 1900. A few scattered Africans, a few people from the Caribbean, W. E. Boys from the United States. They did not ask for the in independence of African states then. They asked for preparation. Give us the kind of education that will prepare us for eventual independence. They were reasonable, but they weren't listened to. And yet the conference made some kind of impression. After the first Congress, Du Bois would be the leading light from the second through fourth. But the most meaningful, the one that Du Bois called in Paris, as a result of this Congress, Du Bois came to center stage as the leader and theoretician of Pan-Africanism. Pan-Africanism wasn't exactly new because black Americans were practicing it long before someone gave it a name. The African settlement movement, the movement that settled Liberia, was in form of Pan-African movement. The so-called Negro Convention movement was most a discussion of how you bring the African world together. That whole 19th century was Pan-African thought. Prince Hall, his development of the black Masonic order that he called the African Lodge, the search for a place in Africa for settlement by Martin Delaney and Robert Campbell. 1829, David Walker's appeal to the colored people of the world was basically a Pan-African appeal. All of this, before we come down to the end of the 19th century. The ultimate Pan-Africanist, of course, was the Jamaican Marcus Garvey. Citizens of Africa, I greet you in the name of the Universal Negro Movement Association and African Communities League of the World. You may ask, what organization is that? It is for me to inform you that the Universal Negro Movement Association is an organization that seeks to unite into one solid body the 400 million Negroes of the world. It was soon after the end of World War I, the Secretary of War had told the black American soldiers that their lot would not be appreciably changed by virtue of the fact that they fought in the war. There had been an investigation. It was discovered that many of the nurses wouldn't treat black soldiers in the hospital, wouldn't even touch them. Some of them died as a result. So you have these grievances pent up in the veteran coming home. All of this came to a head in 1919 when there were riots all over the United States that's called the Red Summer. Marcus Garvey could point out, look, they don't want you here. Let's go back home. Let's go to Africa. Go back to Africa. Let's not only go back to Africa, let's go back in our own ship. Now a whole lot of people who otherwise would not listen, now willing to listen. We hear the cry of France for the Frenchman, of Germany for the German, of Ireland for the Irish, of Japan for the Japanese. We of the Universal Negro Movement Association are raising the cry of Africa for the Africans, those at home and those abroad. He began to dream the great dream and rescue the mind of millions of black Americans from depression and self-doubt. By 1923, he was in some difficulty with the boats and some of the people he had hired to run the boats. Terrible mismanagement and betrayal. He collected millions of dollars from black Americans to buy these boats. And these boats were old and 
not as seaward as he thought they were. Garvey moved over large territory, maybe too fast, and yet he built the largest movement in black America before our sense. That needs to be a reassessment of Marcus Garvey and his long-reaching effects. He called attention to what slavery and colonialism had taken away. They took away a concept essential to all the people in the world. They took away the concept of state management and state maintenance. Once you are taken from the geography of your origin and forced to live in a state, designed by others, you're still the slave to the man who's astute enough to control a container called the state. The cannons of World War II were barely cold when Africans met in Manchester, England. They were prepared to claim that container called the state for themselves. The Pan-African Congress of 1945 now you have the one thing you did not have in the rest of them. You have Caribbean scholars, African-American scholars, not a hell of a lot, and Africans themselves are now participating. We're not talking about Africa out of the presence of Africa. Now you're talking about Africans with the Africans on the scene. One African being the co-convener of the conference, Kwame Nkrumah. Out of that fifth Pan-African Congress came the mentality, the basic planning to rule and to take over nation. The others were saying, give us the education. At the fifth Pan-African Congress, they said, we got the education. We got the manpower. We want to rule now. The people of Ghana resisted British rule from the very beginning. In March of 1957, they become the first Africans to win their freedom. Kwame Nkrumah was ready to rule. When I knew Nkrumah in the Harlem History Club days, my impression of him was not as the future head of state, but as an African who's going to go back and make a major contribution to his nation. And he was a committed African. I went to Africa in 1958 because I had been promising myself of, I was going to get to Africa next year. That, that promise of myself went on for about five years before I actually got there. When I got there, uh, all I had was a return ticket. I told an African who had, who had read one of my stories in an African magazine and wrote and got my address. I said I was coming to Ghana, get me a place in a hotel for a few days, and he didn't even go to a hotel, he even try. He took me to the slums of Accra, and I lived right there with him. Finally, a check that was due me uh, from America did not arrive. When it did arrive, it bounced. <laughs> so, there I was, and one day, Nkrumah had gone someplace. He's coming home from a visit of state. A whole lot of people along the highway hailing his return, and so I was along with the rest of them. I was just, just like another African melting into the crowd. And he spotted me, and they stopped the Rolls Royce, and the motorcycle drivers pulled their guns, thought that someone was about to hurt the president, you know. <laughs> his, his motorcade stopped, and he, and he came out. And <laughs> he said, what the hell are you doing in my country? <laughs> And I just laughed. <laughs> you see, you're a long way from Harlem. <laughs> he looked right and said, where do you live? I said, in uh, in Jamestown. Jamestown is the, the slums of Accra. Still is. He shook his head and said, you sure must love Africa. <laughs> so, <laughs> finally headed back to his car and he turned back to me. He said, you know what I'm going to do for you? I told him I didn't have any job and my check had bounced. And I didn't even know how I was going to get home. 
I won't put your Harlem behind to work. And he gave me a job. <laughs> Working on his newspaper, the Evening News. <clears throat> the significance of Ghana independence at that time is that it gave spirit to the whole of the African world. It was a major impact on black America because it came at the time the, the civil rights movement was reaching a crescendo, a great height. His first vision of pan-Africanism was the physical unification of Africa. He said that gun and freedom won't mean anything until the rest of Africa is free. So the spirit of Ghanaian independence would create a light of hope in the rest of Africa. This is what a Kwame Nkrumah was trying to build. This is what the intelligence services of the United States, England, and France had to destroy to keep the example of Ghana from emerging. What went wrong was our misunderstanding of what a state consists of and, and the responsibility that goes into holding one together and our dependence on our colonial masters more than we anticipated. We who had longed so much for power, we wanted power, power. When we got close enough to touch it, we realized we hadn't even decided what we were going to do with it once we get it. I want to take this opportunity to welcome again to the United States, which he knows so well, the first citizen of Ghana, President Nkrumah. I was in the anti-poverty program in Harlem, and when Nkrumah came and spoke at the United Nations, I got the picture and showed it to them, and I got the speech. And the first thing I showed them, I said, look, there's a black man, head of a nation, speaking to the world. He got coarse, nappy hair. He didn't apologize for it. He said, here I am, African and black and bold and powerful and head of a nation. And I got something to say to you. And this is what I got to say. resistance of Gandhi, and we should understand this, was a strategy. I regard myself as a soldier, though a soldier of peace. I received the inspiration uh, to carry on in the nonviolent tradition from Jesus of Nazareth and the operational technique from Mahatma Gandhi. The passive resistance of the civil rights movement was sold as a way of life. A strategy is never a way of life. A strategy is something you use the same as you use an orange. When the juice is gone, you throw it in the garbage can. And Mahatma Gandhi was an East Indian nationalist, but a very skillful politician. And he always had a violent alternative waiting in the wing just in case his nonviolence didn't work. Today marks the beginning of a determined, organized, mobilized campaign to get the right to vote all over this state. I think Dr. Martin Luther King was the spiritual leader of the black movement, of the civil rights movement, and probably one of the finest theologians that we produced in recent years. He was a dreamer, and yet he was a committed man to struggle, and he made great sacrifice within that struggle. I had some strong disagreements with him. I never thought that we should be locked into the concept of nonviolence as a way of life. 
I was perfectly willing to use it as a strategy. I think we should be slow in criticizing Martin Luther King. He was brave enough to put his life on the line for what he believed. We are still here talking. That's proof enough of his bravery over ours. I think the march on Washington was just that. It wasn't a march on Washington, it was a march in Washington. I don't know of any sweeping achievements that came out of it. It was a great ceremony. I'd be hard pressed to identify the substance. I happen to think we've gotten enough mileage out of marching. It was a great ceremony. It was a great rehearsal for a show we did not put on the road. For a time, we had the attention of the world. Between the Civil Rights Movement, the Caribbean Federation Movement, and the African Independence Movement, we had the attention of the world, and there were people, though they hated our guts, they were willing to make concessions to us based on the fact that we were ready to handle power. We made too many speeches and didn't do the necessary work, the unglamorous off-camera work that would have made it possible. That was our great mistake. Ceremony that lacked substance. And that was a voice, loud and clear, and analytical. We were fighting to keep from hearing that voice. It was the voice of Big Bad Malcolm X, who had both the national and the international message. One of the reasons that it is bad for us to continue to just refer to ourselves as so-called Negro, that's negative. When we say so-called Negro, that's pointing out what we aren't, but it isn't telling us what we are. We are African, and we happen to be in America. We're not American. We are people who formerly were Africans who were kidnapped and brought to America. I met him first in 1958. I know him from that period until his death, and sometimes saw him on a daily basis. I, I would furnish information on history and background information. I never told Malcolm X what to do, and I don't remember anybody else who told him what to do either. They have studied the tactics and the strategy and the methods of all of the uh, African nations who have emerged and won their independence. And they've seen that the Africans didn't get it by sitting in. They didn't get it by wading in. They didn't get it by singing, We Shall Overcome. They got it through nationalism. I first met Malcolm at the World's Trade Show building. Looked me up and down and said, I bet you're a swine eater. I'll admit that I had paid some joyful visits to pork chops and other parts of the pig. And I said that, you know, Malcolm, if it wasn't for the pig, you and I wouldn't be here arguing about the pig, because some of us would be gone. <laughs> we would have starved to death. Many times when Malcolm X was prefacing his speeches with the words the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us, Malcolm X was teaching Malcolm X lessons over and beyond anything the Honorable Elijah Muhammad ever thought about. You say, we are on the road now to a better world because the white man promised integration. This is a disgrace. Mr. Muhammad's uh, analysis is that until the image of the black man in the mind of the black man has been changed, uh, you will always have delinquency, parental as well as uh, juvenile. So his entire approach is not so much to change the attitude of the white man toward the black man, but to change the attitude of the black man about himself. The Arabs and certain powerful groups within Islam 
really wanted Malcolm on their side. There was a serious attempt to persuade Malcolm to turn on Elijah Muhammad and establish a second Islamic group based on what they consider to be orthodox Islam. They offered him three and a half million. He turned it down and we were walking down the street uh, toward his car and this man had turned down three and a half million dollars and whacked me on the shoulder and says, Swine eater, let me buy you a cup of coffee. He was more loyal to Elijah Muhammad than Elijah Muhammad eventually was to him. Elijah Muhammad was getting old and feeble and there was suspicion that Malcolm X would be the logical successor. There were those within the nation who didn't want Malcolm X as the logical successor because Malcolm X would have done some serious house cleaning. He was an honest man and there were some thieves in the house. I think his development as a Pan-Africanist came a little later in his life. In the final analysis, he was as good a Pan-Africanist as any of the rest. We have to have the type of understanding of Africa and the type of understanding of our people here in order to build a bridge, a contact, a line of communication between the two. And once the lines of communication have been established and our African brothers can, can, can um, stretch forth their hands and reach out, and we can stretch forth our hands and reach them why there's nothing that this blue-eyed man in this country will be able to do to you and me successfully from that day onward. Malcolm X had laid down a threat to the colonial powers of the world. It is nationalism that's bringing freedom to oppressed people all over the world. It, is, it was nationalism that brought freedom to the Algerians. It was nationalism that brought freedom to the Nigerians and to the Ghanaians. I do not think Malcolm X's murder was a local American thing. I think it was a larger thing than that. But I do not think that Farrakhan had anything directly to do with the murder, but I do think Farrakhan is guilty of creating the attitude and the atmosphere that led to the murder. Without Farrakhan, Malcolm X, I think, still would have been assassinated. We were friends from the day we met until until his death. When I got the word of his death, I was in Connecticut. I'd gone up to make a speech in Connecticut, and I was at a Jewish home. Someone announced that he died, and then someone added, dismissing the whole thing, that after all, he was anti-Semitic. I know the man well enough to know that he really didn't hate anybody. He hated certain things people did. But he wasn't a hater at all, and they spoke as though they had the right to tell us who should and should not be, uh, be our hero. I went into that bathroom, and it was after dinner, and just cried like a child for 15 minutes, and I came out partly composed, and made the speech that night I was asked to make and came on home and began to try to deal with the uh, reality of the situation. Because to me, Malcolm X was not gone and he's still not gone in my imagination. The whole year after his death, uh, I almost got the feeling that we were having our usual conversation. I was always in it. What can I do? And finally, I got the feeling that he had said, do your best work. 
I was a good teacher before that. I was a better teacher and a better human being after that because I knew that being a good classroom teacher was my best work. Conditions to do until they begin to adjust themselves to those conditions. Rebellions will continue and they will escalate. Um, to fight for our liberation by any means necessary. It was the beginning of the Black Power movement. It was also the Black and Beautiful movement moving into second gear. I would like to think that wearing the Afro, wearing the African clothes was a move toward Africa. To some extent, it was a form of African consciousness, an African awakening. As a result of it, African people were stimulated throughout the world. But what followed the stimulation? What institutions came out of it? What of lasting value came out of it? I do not think the Africans, the Caribbeans, or the black Americans have studied with any degree of depth and seriousness the rise of modern Japan. They went into a war and they lost. They sustained two atomic bombs. They had that country occupied now the people that defeated them are now begging them for commercial space. What did they do that we have forgotten how to do? They did some serious, astute planning. Not loud mouthing, not boasting. They did not get on the radio or any platform and call anybody any name, but they did what they had to do. If we are carrying out a well-designed program for liberation, if it's written out, any literate person can contribute and share leadership. So if the leader dies while you're on page 13, Move to page 14 and continue the struggle. Bear the man, continue the plan. I think every person that calls themselves a leader, a preacher, a policymaker of any kind should ask and answer the question in his own lifetime, how will my people stay on this earth? How will they be educated? How will they be schooled? How will they be housed? And how will they be defended? The answer to these questions will create the concept of enduring nationhood because it creates the concept of enduring responsibility. Good morning! Assalamu alaikum, my dear brothers, black men, strong black men, upright black men, sober black men, together black men, unity black men, freedom black men, justice black men, welcome to the Million Man March. One million black men make their way to the nation's capital. 
They are answering Minister Louis Farrakhan's call for unity, redemption, and atonement. It's the largest demonstration in American history. Marching is a strategy, and I think we have gotten enough out of the strategy. I think the march is a waste of shoe leather, gas, and energy. I have some serious problems with any kind of march for our liberation that leaves out one half of the mentality of our people, the women. I don't buy the rationale that the women need to stay home and take care of the children, you know. I ain't buying that. If they have no honorable place in your liberation, your liberation is not worth the fight. Because you can't build no family struggle. You can't have no continuum. You can't even continue your name without that connection. Long live the spirit of the Million Man March. Long live the spirit of the Million Man March. I'm saying there's more to revolution than throwing your fist in the air. There's more to progress than marching. I want to say, my brothers, this is a very pregnant moment, pregnant with the possibility of tremendous change in our status in America and in the world. We're doing showbiz liberation. And that's not liberation. Today, whether you like it or not, God brought the idea through me. And he didn't bring it through me because my heart was dark with hatred and anti-Semitism. He didn't bring it through me because my heart was dark and I'm filled with hatred for white people and for the human family of the planet. If my heart were that dark, how is the message so bright, the message so clear, the response so magnificent? This march will do more to wash Farrakhan's ego and to project him into the forefront of leadership than anything else. And once he's in the forefront of leadership, where will he lead us? Allah Akbar! God is great! God is great! State to Islam. And yet he will not make a principled statement on the enslavement of Africans in Mauritania and in the Sudan. And there's all kinds of documentation, all kinds of proof. If I have to be a dissenting voice in this, then I'm very pleased that I've got enough integrity to be a dissenting voice and not to care where the chips fall. Many perceive the African-American family as an endangered species. To Dr. Clark, the family is the soul, the spirit, and the cornerstone of the nation. If the family dies, so does the nation. We're making a whole new way of life out of the artificiality of imitating our oppressor, who's also in trouble with the family. And we grew up in communities where every child was a child of the whole community and could be disciplined and rewarded by anyone in the community. Now we brought into someone else's sociology don't touch that child. Don't you dare spank my child. When formerly, your mother left you alone and said, if they misbehave, you, you can spank them. We don't have that kind of relationship one to the other anymore. After emancipation, we made a monumental effort to find broken bits and pieces of our family. My own grandmother spent three years wandering around Virginia trying to find her first husband who had been sold to a slave breeding farm in Virginia. But the major thing was we would try and put families together and to have family connections. Our new mission of liberation is to put strong families together again because the family is not only the embryo of the beginning, 
of all that we can call civilization, but it's the beginning of all anyone can call a civilization. Because well, this is the essential network that leads to nation. There's some common sense things we can still be doing. Our communities are miniature nations. We have to control them. Control the real estate in those communities. Control the education in those communities. You cannot write the history of this nation as though it is only a white nation. It's a multicultural nation. I'm saying whatever the solution is, either we are in charge of our own destiny, or we are not in charge. On that point, we got to be clear. You either free or you're a slave. I want people to remember me as a creative classroom teacher. I'm self-educated, and I've read more books than most men see in a lifetime. Fortunately, I still remember the better portions of most of them, but I haven't seen the last of my life or the last of my energy. So I decided if you lose your eyesight, increase your insight. Use what you got and keep on doing the things that give your life meaning and give your life definition. I like for them to remember that I have been consistent. I took certain principal stands in my late teenage. Now at the age of 80, I have not discarded these principal stands. My great overpowering love affair has been the liberation and the maintenance of African people and to restore them to a status that they lost in the world. I think faith has not spared African people for an ideal purpose. If we were put on this earth and we have endured a Holocaust ten times worse than the one in Europe, then faith has a mission for us. If we gave the world its first humanity, maybe we have the capacity to give the world it's next humanity.